Right now, Game of Thrones is getting, what, 23 million views? Is it? That's how many people are on the island of Taiwan. Lots of Christian Bible teachers, including some who are very close to, like, my friend of my friend that someone I know, like, in that thing, they're, like, really close to me. And one of them is John Piper. I actually went to class with Ben at Moody, Ben Piper, John Piper's son. And he wasn't there through the whole semester because Turkey had an earthquake. And so Ben Piper and three of his buddies went to Turkey to help volunteer to clean up the mess from the earthquake because they're awesome people. And one of the things that John Piper has been saying is that Game of Thrones is not good. Lots of Christians watch it and they just act like it's nothing. And John Piper is basically saying, no, um, that's not good. Now, I don't know what John Piper has actually said. I haven't listened to what John Piper has actually said about this. And I don't care to. And I don't need to listen to what John Piper said because I'm not critiquing what John Piper said. I'm only saying that John Piper is not pro Game of Thrones. And I love John Piper. And he's got good reasons for everything that he says. I'm not here to argue with John Piper. You should listen to John Piper if you are a Christian. He has good points and he has very good things to say. But I do want to talk about this idea that we need to attack Christians who watch Game of Thrones. And then I'm going to give some of my own little background in Game of Thrones and what I think about it and give my critique and so forth of Game of Thrones. And I'm going to talk about, uh, maybe I'll give some predictions for season eight since that's the last and final season. But I'm going to qualify why I'm talking about all those things because I'm a writer, I'm a Christian, I'm a Bible-believing, solid Christian. I'm not like one of these alternate, weird, whack Christians. Other than the fact that I don't believe that a licensed pastor is necessary for Christian fellowship. That's kind of an unwritten rule. You don't see that in statements of faith. But other than that, I'm like right straight down the line, like Christian Bible believer. I studied it in college. I've written a 90,000 word theology book called Mere Theology. I have translated the book of Revelation from Greek into English, 10,000 words, plus another 100,000 words on why I translated it the way that I did. And I'm just about to finish my own kind of uh, fantasy fic. I call it uh, granular angel opera. For those of you that know what those words mean, granular angel opera. But as a writer, I have some very good reasons why I have some very strong opinions about Game of Thrones. But first of all, let's talk about the problem with the Christian situation. Christians should not be finding excuses to tolerate things. And this is a big, big, big problem. On one end, we have excessive lordship stuff, which basically is the idea that, well, you're supposed to obey God's rules because you know you're supposed to. And there's not much about how common sense they are. It's like you sort of get this impression that God's rules are nonsensical and he just expects you to follow him because you should want to follow nonsense rules because God's Lord, right? And then on the other extreme, you've got the excess grace thing. And that, not necessarily I'm talking about the, te the grace theology teachers like Tony Evans, but people that radicalize things and say, look, I'm having an affair, or I'm cheating, or I can go watch dirty movies because Jesus will forgive me. And it's like, no, that's not really what we want to celebrate. And I think that a lot of grace theology teachers would not condone that either. That's like an extreme thing. And so we had these two extremes among Christians. And what both of them miss is that God's laws, God's commands are practical. They make sense. If you do certain things, you'll have certain results. And unfortunately, the Lordship people say that the extreme not te necessarily teachers, but the extreme grace people want to have a license to sin. And the grace people don't say that they want to have a license to sin. They want a license to live and not be burdened down with rules that don't make sense. Well, that makes sense, but they're misrepresented by the Lordship people. But then again, the grace people still miss the fact that what they actually are looking for is a license to avoid bad consequences for bad choices because bad choices do yield bad consequences, right? Well, that's something that a lot of everybody and a lot of people and everybody and a lot have forgotten, including the people that teach this lordship thing. To them, rules are just rules and they're shoulds and they don't make sense. And there's no sense in any of it. The truth is the best kept secret in the church is that God's commands make sense. God's commands bless us. God commands us that we live. The weird rules for the Old Testament with Israel was for a time when 
they didn't have soap and God wanted them to survive and God would not teach them what soap was because the first angels came down and did that and that sort of made a mess of things. God does not teach us science through the Bible. That's our responsibility to learn at our own pace. And if someone teaches that to us too fast, like from God or angels, then that messes things up. God just wanted Israel to live. He said, do this and you will live. Honor your father and mother so that your life may be long, not so that I will interrupt the normal life and magically make your life longer. That's not what he said. So. Let's go through here and look at how the church is reacting to Game of Thrones. Yes, there is this imbalance between ridiculous rule and beating people over the head and that sort of stuff. And then like just this lack of ownership of any good choices at all. Yes, that's a terrible balance. And oh, I'm so popular on Facebook. Everyone's messaging me. So there is this problem, but there are other big, huge problems Jesus did not say, go into all the world and make everyone feel like he's worthless. And Jesus did not say, make sure that you attack each other and you take the pot pans and spoons and you bang and make noise in the streets and tell Christians how bad and worthless they are. And make sure, by the way, if Game of Thrones or anything like it ever comes out, that you forget the fact that it might be a good quality movie, that it might actually have an interesting story. Forget the fact that your own Christian literature is incredibly boring. Forget all that. Just make sure that you tell all the Christians who watch it that they're not Christians and they're bad people. That's not what Jesus said to do. Jesus also did not say, go into all the world and tell the world that it is right. He didn't say to do that either. As I recall, Jesus was a carpenter, which takes me to an issue with the pilgrims. And we will come back to that in just a moment. But first, Jesus had this idea that life is eternal and it can begin now. And that it comes from our choices. And Paul said, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if anything has virtue, if anything is praiseworthy, think on these things. Paul did not say, if anything is unvirtuous, if anything is not of good report, if anything is not praiseworthy, don't think on those things. He didn't say it that way. You have to have good, positive ideas going into your head. You can't just vacuum all the negativity out of your brain and then leave your head empty. You have to focus on putting good things into your head. So, yes, Game of Thrones has a lot of problems from a religious perspective, but from a quality story perspective, there are many good things that are in it. And then there are many story problems uh, with Game of Thrones that the, 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 the Bible teacher critics never actually get to. So in terms of criticizing Bible, let's go back to focus on the family. Uh, and I say criticizing Bible, I mean like from the movie perspective, from the pop culture book and TV show perspective. Several years ago, Focus on the Family had these magazine article critique things that they'd have about pop culture and, uh, you know, movies. And they would write these negative reviews about the movies that were in the theaters. And I remember one of them being like uh, about Superman, like, you know, he's not this and he's not so cool. And he does that. And he's and Jesus is way better. I'd never want to have that super freak for my life. It was something like that. It was just cynical and it was degrading and it wasn't anything good to say. And yet they called it a movie review. And it was almost as if it was intended as some sort of a pitch to try to convince high school students to not watch Superman at all. And then there were these like Christian periodicals that have these reviews that would tell you what all the different swear words were and how many times they appeared in each film. And when I was at Moody taking our mass comm class, one of the fellow students, one of the girls, raised her hand and asked our teacher, Dr. Fetzer, uh, Doc, who are the people that they're supposedly Christian reporters who object to movies with all this bad language, but then they watch these movies to record all these things in the first place, the movies that they say we shouldn't watch? Isn't there, like, a problem with that? And, of course, there wasn't really much of an answer for us in that mass comm class at Moody. But reviews. If it's wrong for me to review Game of Thrones, then Focus on the Family is absolutely wrong for having done the reviews that they did. And follow precedent. You know I'm right. I'll stick to that. So let's talk about the pilgrims. When the pilgrims came across from England, there were actually two groups among them. There were the saints and the strangers. The saints were the Bible-thumping Christians, and the strangers were a bunch of non-Christians who were actually able to do things because the Christians couldn't actually do stuff. Like, maybe they were gardeners at most, but for the most part, the Christians didn't know how to build their own ship. They didn't know how to engineer stuff and they didn't, there's a lot of they didn't know how to do. So they had to bring all these non-Christians with them because they didn't know how to make things. I mean, think about that. 
Christians that don't know how to work with wood? I mean, the founder of Christianity, Jesus, was a carpenter. I mean, when, when, when the pilgrims were sailing across, the, I do believe it was the main mast that broke, and all the Christians on the Mayflower just prayed that God would help them, and all the non-Christians got irritated on the Mayflower and said, God is not going to fix the main mast, we will, and then they fixed the main mast, and all the Christians were happy that God fixed the main mast, and that kind of tension was going on. Well, the Mayflower eventually... I mean, it was coming down. If you look at a globe, it's actually kind of a line over top. They were coming down and kind of got to get close to the coast a bit early, and they had to land up far north. And originally they wanted to go down south where the British already had this thing set up, but instead the pilgrims landed in the north, not in the south. So the Christians with the pilgrims founded the north and everything that went with the north, and it was not in the south, wink, wink, north, south, uh, where... Uh, Plymouth Rock actually was and who landed where and what didn't land on who. But the Christians landed to the north with the non-Christians and the non-Christians and the pilgrims wanted to journey south, but winter was coming and it wasn't exactly the time for a land journey. And so the Christians and the non-Christians did this pact, the Mayflower Compact, these two groups that did not get along, did not like each other, but they had to in order to survive and there was lots of this, oh, hail the great and glorious, his name and the titles, titles about the king. And that was probably there because they were supposed to go down to be with, like, the British, you know, base down below. So this wasn't an act of rebellion. It was for survival. But those pilgrims brought with them all these non-Christians that they didn't agree with. And the only reason that all those non-Christians came was because those pilgrims weren't actually able to do stuff. They just prayed and expected the non-Christians to have the skill. And even to this day, those two groups in America are still fighting, Christians and non-Christians. And had the pilgrims simply learned how to be good at stuff and just know how to do stuff and do a good job and work with their hands, then either they would have won the respect of those non-Christians on board their boat and they all would have been happy together, or maybe they wouldn't have needed them and there wouldn't have been the fighting and stuff, you know. But all of this conflict in America comes because Christians aren't good at things. So speaking of not being good at things, let's talk about most of the pop culture uh, level quality Christian genre stuff that's out there versus what's in the non-Christian or other than Christian part in area of the media. Game of Thrones has been accused of being pornography. Now, I broke myself out of pornography when I was 16 years old. It is an addiction. It is a grip. It is not something that you want to have. It's not something you want to live your life with because pornography is a genre of printed or video material or something that's driving at the purpose of inciting lust and a drive to pursue immoral ideas and possibly activities. And Ted Bundy, before he died, interviewed Dr. James, or had an interview with Dr. James Jobson and talked about how pornography was one of the biggest things that pushed him to do that, contrary to all the lies that Hugh Hefner told and uh, Ron Jeremy and, and those guys who say that pornography makes people more moral or something, which is just a way so they can sleep at night. But absolutely pornography is dangerous and it is terrible, but pornography is a genre that has a pure purpose, a sole purpose to try to drive people to those lustful and immoral thoughts and pursuits. What we have in Game of Thrones isn't pornography. At most, it would be drive-by porn, like a quick, like, what was, uh, why did they do that? Or maybe flashing might be a better term, or nudity. And yes, we do need to be technical in our words, because if we're going to make a proper critique, we need to be accurate. We need to give accurate, good feedback. Judgment, since we're judging, is a technical skill. It requires technical work. It requires well thought through research and well thought through opinion. And you can't just go and judge people and throw a 20 year sentence on something without saying what the something is. You have to know and understand what's actually going on. No, Game of Thrones is not porn. It's nudity and it's arguably uh, maybe flashing. And then you've also got a lot of arguments for immorality, which I do object to, like the conversation with Sir Davos and uh, Daenerys' uh, right-hand girl, where they talk about, well, from our culture, we don't have marriage, so the concept of a bastard doesn't exist. And Sir Davos says, well... 
that's kind of liberating. That's kind of liberating. And and you're like, really? Jon Snow doesn't know who his parents are. Is that really liberating to grow up without a mom and a dad dedicated to each other? I mean, if you want to go down that road and try that, okay. But those types of conversations, the suggestions against morality, those are some of the deeper problems, folks, with Game of Thrones. But you don't get there if all that people are saying bad about it is the fact that it's got uh, some nudity in it, not all, not a, not most of it, not even most episodes. I'm going to make some predictions about what I think is coming in the last and final, supposedly, how long are they going to make you go, uh, season of Game of Thrones, season eight. Because if I can't make some sort of um, you know, prediction about general understanding of what's actually going on because it's sort of a what's going to happen next type of a series, then I don't really understand it enough to critique it. I do not critique people that I haven't heard all the way through. I'm not going to take Trump. I'm not going to take Obama and listen to either one of them based on just their sound bites and complain about the sound bites. I will listen to the speech all the way through or I won't have anything to say about it. If he has a sound bite, either one that's absolutely terrible and unacceptable, I am not going to critique it because I didn't listen to the speech all the way through. If you can't listen all the way through, you can't critique it. And so I am making some predictions about the heavy prediction series Game of Thrones season eight because if I can't make some sort of intelligent like could see maybe why he's right prediction then I don't really know it well enough to critique about it and there are other critiques about Game of Thrones that need to be given. So because the mind is sharp and full of theories I have some ideas I'm going to go through about season eight. Now remember a clarifier I read my bible a lot. I pray a lot. I studied Bible in college. I believe the Bible that I studied. I've written about it. I know it. I've read the book of Revelation a hundred times. I pray a lot. I see miracles in my life. I pray for things to happen, circumstances that I need, and they happen. I live a life of daily miracles. It's kind of over it from AsiaWithLove.net, which you should subscribe for $10 a year because it's like living history, but that's a whole other topic I'm not going to get into right now. But I live a life that's exciting and I see miracles and I have these things in my life and the magic and the coolness or whatever in Game of Thrones doesn't impress me. I'm interested in a well-woven plot from Martin, the author, because we don't see many good plots, but I don't just watch garbage on TV. I read my Bible every day, folks. I've read it since 1999. It was... October. I decided that a roller coaster, happy, angry, messed up life was not what I wanted, and I read the Bible every day. I think I missed seven days, and five of them were all nighters. Um, and I think I missed one day recently, I'm sad to say, because I've been so busy. Look, you can't always take 30, 15, or five minutes to read your Bible every day, so you have to just promise to open the thing and read it. I'm not filling my mind with Hollywood garbage. So when I tell you this in a minute, that I have opinions about Game of Thrones, I'm going to give you some detailed ideas, but this is not the majority of my life. I have a much heavier life in the Bible. I don't, I don't just try to suck bad things out of my mind. I try to put good things into my mind. And that's what we need to be focusing on, thinking on good things, thinking on powerful, positive things. So I'm not impressed with this. I do not hope that the magic and mysticism of Game of Thrones could ever become real. I don't want that. I'm already captivated and entranced by something far more beautiful and amazing, and that is the beautiful power of Jesus. Now, having said that, I'm going to get into my predictions for Season 8. Before I start... There are three different things we need to review. The Night King and some background, Quaith, and what she's had to say to, Darna to Daenerys. And uh, who is the other one? Uh, oh, Varys. Very interesting creature, Varys. Now, let's start with Varys. We have this merman theory, and then we also have the uh, Valerian theory, that he's one of the lost Laverians from somewhere, uh, uh, scratching, not picking. And I love to have the idea that he's both, but I don't know that we'll have time in a few remaining episodes to figure that all out. But let's go back to what happened with Tyrion. This whole thing about Daenerys taking her dragons north to try to get that, that thing 
uh, to take down to Cersei to try to convince her that she needs to kind of, you know, have a truce and a standoff. That was originally um, Tyrion's idea that they make the truce with Cersei, and that was Tyrion's idea that they get one of the Whites to go show to her, and it was Tyrion's idea to go talk to Cersei alone, and he gave the reassuring nod when Cersei came back and promised that she would go help. Little did anyone know, including her weird, messed up, uh, incest lover, know that she was planning to change colors anyway. Well, what's going to happen is, Daenerys is somehow eventually going to find out about this, and she's going to go back to her previous words to Tyrion, which were, you're just here to try to help your own family or something like that. And she's going to get mad at him, and and he's going to go away and come back somewhere to how Sir Jorah went. I'm going to come back to that later. But the important thing to know is, behind the scenes with Tyrion having made those very terrible mistakes, you've got Varys behind Tyrion, pushing him beforehand. You've got to talk to her. You've got to be the one to do... Why can't Varys be the one to talk to her? You've got to speak to her. We've got to, we've, we've got to talk sense into this woman. I tried to talk sense into her father, and you've got to talk sense into her so she can listen. So Tyrion is reaching out, trying to initiate. They don't know what to do. Varys puts it out to push the conversation forward. Well, how would we ever convince Cersei to believe that these things exist? The obvious answer is to show her one. But he lets Tyrion be the one to arrive at that. So behind the scenes, Varys is whispering in Tyrion's ear. Daenerys' promise that she's going to burn Varys is probably going to come true because, you know, the, the lady in the red dress, like the, the, the harlot of Babylon that manages to make her way into almost every single movie? In this case, it's the Melisandre character. Yeah, well, Melisandre is not the first red priestess to have an encounter with Varys. Uh, he had an encounter before down south, wherever it was, in Essos somewhere. And also his own story uh, also involved uh, blood magic and that sort of thing. So he's dealt with fire and this type of weird stuff before, and that ultimately is going to be his end. He's kind of a warm, squirmy thing, and he's always manipulating behind the scenes, and eventually he's going to manipulate too much, and he's probably going to end up being the... Uh, uh, the, the Tolkien um, fuel for the flame that gives Melisandre power over fire to go burn up a whole bunch of the whites. Because Melisandre is not a liar. She is a deceived, honest uh, fool, but she does have power with fire. And she's going to sneak back up north. She's going to take off her charm. She's going to shapeshift back into that old lady that she really is, 400 years old. And that's how Jon Snow is not going to recognize her. But had she been at Blackwater, she probably would have taken the wildfire and turned it around against King's Landing. But she wasn't there. Now, shapeshifting is actually a thing. Like, that's... And it's not good, folks. It's it's not good. I don't I don't celebrate or enjoy this stuff. I'm just talking about what I think the plot's going to be. So Varus eventually is going to end up being fuel for the fire. Now, we've also got um, the Night King, and the Night King. You know, the world is full of surprises. Martin always wants us to keep guessing and not know what's going to come next. And the Night King keeps looking at Brand and, or Bran and um, uh, Jon Snow or whatever his name is going to be changed to or changed from. He always keeps looking at them with that same look that Aya and Cersei kept giving each other with contempt before they both worked together to catch Peter Baelish. So there are a lot of looks that are sort of intended like facial looks to make the audience think this but actually that's going to happen we don't know what drives the night king and we know that if the night king just wants to go kill everybody then he's the only uh one-dimensional character in the entire story and that wouldn't make sense and that wouldn't make for a fun ending he's up to something he wants something and and he didn't run up to bran and slash him he ran up to bran and touched him so bran like, it's like he wants to communicate with the Starks. He wants a Stark to talk to. Would someone please talk to me? And we have to ask ourselves, why did he break the wall down over at Eastwatch? Why didn't he break down the wall in the middle? I mean, if the Night King was against the wall, he wouldn't have broken down this little tiny place over on the cliffs where you could just theoretically smack the cliffs, knock them into the sea, and then the wall is still guarding everything. I mean, I sort of buy into that theory that the White Walkers helped construct the wall because it was part of a truce between the North and the South, and that now there have been violations, there are problems, 
the Night King needs to talk to somebody, and he needs to get a big parade to go down with him so he can actually knock on the door and get someone to answer. And he's just knocked down enough of the wall so he can make his way south. I don't see if, if he's going to walk and how far he can walk his little army of animated corpses, I don't see an invasion of King's Landing from the Night King. I don't see that happening. But it almost seems like the Night King is going to become one of those characters where, where he's going to like walk up to Winterfell and he's just going to bang on the door and Aya's is going to answer with needle at his throat and she's going to say, my, that's some icy breath. And he's going to say, Mentos, would you like one? And then she says, oh, I thank you. And then he goes back home. Not quite like that, but something sort of like that. But if it becomes a Super Bowl advertisement, I called it first. But there's going to be some sort of a twist with the Night King. We have to expect that. There's more going on. He may be bad, but we need to know why. It's, it's, it's again, it's like you've got Francis Xavier and you've got um, Eric, uh, whatever his name was, Magneto. You know, the, the, the villains are villains, but they have complex reasons, and that's going to be part of the surprise ending. And Martin is giving us clues. I am not going to try to read his mind, but Martin is... I mean, he, he does leave clues that he wants readers to be able to sort of accurately guess what's coming. And I'm only trying to pick up the clues that he's leaving. I'm not going to try to read and divine or look into the flames to see what things Martin has not disclosed. He is setting things up for multiple opportunities, and he's going to just pick one of them to surprise us. And for those things, I am grabbing my popcorn. There's more to the Night King than we expect. Third, we've got Kaith, or maybe she was second, the Night King was third. Quaith, or Kaith, depending on your pronunciation, said uh, a few things to Daenerys in the books. And one of those things was that you have to go south if you want to go north or something like that. It was you, if you want to go west, you first have to go east. If you want to go to the light, you first have to go to the darkness or something like that. It's sort of an upside down, reversed, uh, you know, non-intuitive way of thinking. Well... That's ultimately what Daenerys had to do. I mean, she couldn't just go to Westeros directly. She had to wait and get the Dothraki army to go with her. And she had to have Theon's ships come from Westeros, sailing over east to get her to take her back. And in now she's at King's, or she's up at Dragonstone, and I think that she's going to have to go down to King's Landing and invade that first before she can deal with what's happening up at North, and it's going to be for semi-complex reasons. And then there's that whole East-West thing. I think she might go back. So that's the issue with Kaith. So we've got these three. We've got Varys, who eventually becomes fuel for the fire. We've got the Night King, who's going to be a wild card at the end. And then we've got um, some, uh, you know, some stuff that, that, that Quaith said uh, to Daenerys about needing to go this way to go that way and go that way to go this way and stuff. So... Here's what I think is going to start to transpire in Season 8. I've got some really strong opinions, and then I've got some other maybe guesses that I'm just kind of waiting, and I'm going to let Martin surprise me on. Aya Stark, we're going to find... I mean, she wanted Peter Baelish's face, and Sansa wanted her to have Peter Baelish's face. So what Aya is going to do is she's going to get Peter Baelish's face because Sansa never answered her question. She said, I, you know, I've, she quoted him, I play a little game when someone's doing something. I ask, what's the, what's the worst possible motive? She said, you do this, you do that. You turn family against family. You create fighting with all kinds of people. I mean, Peter Baelish, you make different families fight with each other like Christians from different denominations do in America. Oh, no, wait, was that actually in the movie? Oops, sorry. But she, she says, you do this, but she never answered the question why. Ultimately, she wants Aya to get his face so that she can answer the question why. So Aya's going to take his face because she's not done doing the face thing. I mean, and she just has a fresh new face. She's going to go find out what Baelish was ultimately up to. Now, she has all the information she needs because now Dragonstone with Tyrion and Daenerys are now sort of a thing with Winterfell because it's going to be Dragonstone and Winterfell have this relationship thing. So Tyrion knows that King's Landing got in all kinds of debt because Peter Baelish would just rub his hands and borrow money from the Iron Bank. Well, that's not easy for, or that's not uh, easy to overlook. That's not hard to figure out. So Aya is going to get Peter's face and eventually she's going to find a, find herself in Bravos and talk to the Iron Bank or something like that and find, or an Iron Banker and find out what he was up to, that he was actually a tool of the Iron Bank to create war in a Tony Stark kind of way to fund both sides. War profiteering, interesting name. But Aya is going to find out that this was going on I think it's likely, since we had that one Iron Bank go talk to Cersei, I think that he could be uh, end up being uh, one of Aya's new faces. 
and then now I'm kind of stretching on a limb depending on how much you want to cram into episodes and how much you have room for. I think it's entirely possible she gets another new face from the Iron Bank, gets angry with them and goes and finds out who they were going to give the money to, finds out that Theon's uncle is getting funded with this elephant army, and then she's going to find out that Cersei, somehow or another, she's going to find out that Cersei uh, has has gone back on her word, which she didn't know there was a word, but Daenerys will find out about that and she'll go tell Daenerys because Winterfell and Dragonstone are a thing now. I think it would be really fun if uh, Cersei finds out that the Iron Banker she's talking to is also a faceless man. That would be a wonderful, fun plot twist. Um, but uh, I don't know how much they're going to have time for. Either way, uh, the actor for Peter Baelish does make a return, just like uh, uh, some other things happened in episode one. Um, some people who were supposed to be dead uh, running around talking. Aya is going to put on his face and go find this out. Now, Daenerys, when she finds out what's stirring in the south, that's when she's going to get angry at Tyrion. And she's going to tell him, it was your idea, You're the. Re it was your idea to get the white, it was your idea to meet with Cersei in the first place where we needed the white, and then you were the one who went and talked to her, and I don't know what you said while you were there alone talking to your sister, you're just out for your family, and then what she said to Varys, I'll burn you alive or something like that if you betray me. She gets angry, burns Tyrion Lannister, and finds out he's not a Lannister. He's a Targaryen, because he doesn't get burned with fire. Now, other than Tyrion, there's only one other person that we just saw who tamed, quote-unquote, one of the dragons. The dragon whisperer, the first dragon whisperer, was Tyrion, because he went and unchained the dragons, and they gladly let him do it. Now we've got Jon Snow, who we know also is Targaryen, able to pet Drogo's nose. So... Tyrion uh, also has an interesting connection to the dragons. Back when he unchained the dragons, he talked about how dragons had become small by being confined. And again, in this season, here they are in the great arena that the dragons were in long, long ago. And he picked up one of the little tiny dragon skulls and talked again about how the dragons had been tied up and contained and had become small. Well, hello, Tyrion is small. That's why he keeps talking about small dragons, because ultimately he is a small dragon, uh, kind of. So he gets burned. Daenerys realizes that he's not, he may be a fool, she doesn't like him, she wants to send him away in her Targaryen temper like she did with Ser Jorah, but she rounds up Tyrion, probably newly arrived, Jaime Lannister, and she's going to go down and get all these three siblings together and just have at them all at once. Somehow, this or maybe some other way, but they all end up going with the dragons down to King's Landing to confront the elephant army. Now, I do think it would be fun if Daenerys were to take her dragons out to the Iron Bank, having found out that they funded it, burn up Bravos, take, uh, you know, grab a big iron vault, take all the gold, Bravos loses its money, and now the dragons have a treasure. I don't know if that's going to happen, you know, a treasure at Dragonstone. I don't know if that's going to actually happen, but it would be nice to see that, because uh, I think that would be cool. But ultimately, the dragons and finding out about the plot with the Iron Bank is going to end up diffusing this elephant army and I would like to see it'd be fun to see the elephant army have this massive come about turn about uh see uh all these new uh you know their new queen hail their new queen uh Daenerys because we haven't seen that massive turnaround uh you know shock the whole nation suddenly supports her with Daenerys for a while and we're kind of overdue for one of those so that would be nice to see her turn the elephant army around again she needs to go south to go north but what Daenerys goes down south to confront this elephant army and she takes Tyrion with him and ultim or sends him ahead ultimately uh she gets down there and Theon's, cousin, Theon's uncle shows up, blows the dragon horn that was originally designed by probably the Targaryens to control the dragons. He's not Targaryen, so the sonic vibrations uh, basically vibrates his skull or whatever, and he dies. And he's not Targaryen, so he can't really control it. So all that happens is he causes the dragons to kind of go insane for a little while. Daenerys temporarily loses control. The dragons burn up King's Landing, ignite the wildfire Cersei's been building underneath, destroy the whole thing. Daenerys is sad. She's fell off of Drogo, and now she's all alone. And who goes and rescues her? Just like Ser Jorah came back to help her, Tyrion goes and rides one of the dragons to go help uh, Daenerys and rescue her back, and he's back in her good graces. Now, 
There's a theory about the Hound in the Mountain having a showdown, and that has to happen, of course. Theon's going to go rescue his sister, and he's going to come save the day at some point. That has to happen. It could happen anywhere. I don't see any clues indicating where, but it's got to happen. And probably Cersei and Jaime end up dying next to each other, very hateful. Uh, probably the Mountain is in there killing Jaime or something. I don't know how that works. Um, but, uh, yes, uh, uh, yeah, the hound, the hound has to have a showdown with the mountain. That's been said many times. I think that eventually the, the hound, uh, he's going to end up going north and he's going to be used much later in the film. And he seems to be becoming sort of this quasi religious guy. Like he's sort of been a godless man and now he's starting to get sort of a conscience. So that's going to happen. Eventually that resolves the, the conflict and the different plot lines to the south. Then everything turns north, and that's where Bran really comes back in. And Bran is going to go back, and there's this namesake theory that he's going to become his own namesake in history. That would be interesting to see. Um, but remember when all these theorists are talking about how Bran's going to go whisper in the Mad King's ear, that was actually the Three-Eyed Raven before him, because maybe Bran can only talk to his own relatives. And the Three-Eyed Raven before him, who was a Targaryen, by the way, was whispering in the Mad Kings there saying, burn them all, burn them all, trying to create a warning, but then that created a bigger mess and things didn't work out, which was why he didn't want to tell Bran you're able to change the events of the past through this Three-Eyed Raven thing when Bran called out to his father uh, when he was going up to, that was the Tower of Joy, his young father, when he was going up to to get the, the baby Jon Snow. So um, now... Eventually, Bran goes back, though, and he sees his own, na his own namesake. He follows his own namesake. There, there were several different Bran Starks of the past, and maybe he goes and becomes them, or maybe he goes and follows them, and uh, I don't see clues as to which one that's going to be, but he needs to connect with them at some point. I suspect that eventually he finds another dragon's egg or another sleeping dragon under or near Winterfell. And uh, down in the crypt, and by the way, there are a lot of dead bodies that are buried, and now we've got this um, this uh, Night King marching south where these all these dead bodies buried. I mean, if the Night King shows up at Winterfell, uh, the crypt may come to life, and uh, that could make a lot of things uh, <clears throat> interesting. Well, what if there's a dragon egg down there somewhere? And what if that thing hatches, or there's a hidden dragon buried somewhere else that Bran finds out about? Bran is supposed to fly. Um, now, just one little side note here. There are people that say that the Night King can raise corpses from the dead. He doesn't. He animates corpses, and that's a big difference. So we're still finding out why all this is happening, but Bran Stark is going to go back and I think he's going to find another dragon. There has to be three dragons and I'm waiting for a third dragon to show up. The blue dragon doesn't count. Eventually the blue dragon flies through the wall. One of the other dragons goes with someone flying it to confront the dragon and they have their blue fire, red fire thing because you have to have that for art. It's been set up that way for art and it's coming. So later on we've got... Towards the end, it comes down to Sir Jorah versus Jon Snow for who's going to save the day. And Jon Snow and Daenerys are sort of starting to become a thing. That's going to fall under threat. All the people really want to see Jon Snow. And somehow the Night King's purpose and plot is going to get discovered. Somewhere we're going to find out who the Lord of Light is and the role that the children have and that they're probably all hiding on some that island in the middle of a lake not too far from the, uh, from the Vale. So eventually we're going to find out who's who and all this is going to go down and I'm waiting for the surprises and I'm excited and thrilled to see it. But I think... Benjen Stark somehow proves that the shard of dragon glass to the heart will make someone into the new Night King, but that person can't be Benjen Stark, or Benjen Stark has died and sacrificed himself, or the Night King has his time running out and needs to find a successor, or uh, there's something, some other greater evil to the north that the Night King is holding back. Or there's some there's some other purpose going on here, 
And Jon Snow decides he needs to be the one to become the new Night King to go north, and I think Ser Jorah stops him. It doesn't make sense for Ser Jorah to marry Daenerys because he's kept walking away from his name. He gave Jon his sword. He's the lover-admirer who lo can only ever love her from the distance. It's like the Phantom of the Opera where he wishes he could, but he just can't. needs to let the younger guy, her speed, take over and let them go away. And that could be poetic. If Jon goes north as the new... Um, Night King and Ser Jorah ends up marrying Daenerys, that would be, I mean, I wouldn't be totally surprised, but I'd be kind of disappointed. I really think that it needs to be set up so that it looks like Jon's not going to get together with Daenerys and you all want him to, and then it looks like Ser Jorah may actually be there, but Ser Jorah ends up uh, going north to become the new Night King. That's um, sort of what I anticipate happening. Um, Hot Pie needs to come back in. I think it'd be funny uh, to find out. You know, Sansa probably marries Tyrion, um, and uh, Podrick. I mean, wouldn't it be, it'd be fun to see who gets to marry who as they all settle down at the end. I think there's going to be a number of marriages that come at the end. And I am a little bit of a fan of the theory that it's going to end with Sam writing the journal because he's the new Grand Maester. One other thing about Jon Snow. When Jon burned himself, I believe it was the first season, throwing a lantern at a white, no one saw his wounds. Master Aim, he cried out, but we never saw wounds. Master Aemon was the one who treated him. Master Aemon at, at the wall was also Targaryen. And Sam referred to him as the dragon, uh, as the dragon's blood or something like that. And so Aemon could have only pretended to treat John, and they kept it their little secret that John had gotten burned, made it look like he got burned, but really he didn't. And uh, so we don't. We don't know whether or not yet John can or cannot be burned. That that's left open either way. But we do know that John cannot die by ice because he fell into that lake. So more than likely, John cannot be hurt by the blue fire of the blue dragon. Um, that's just something interesting uh, to bear in mind. So um, I say these things because I have followed. Uh, the series enough to know what's going on, and I do appreciate George R. R. Martin for writing a complex plot like this. I do not celebrate, I do not take delight in some of the dark magic, in the sexual innuendo, in the flash porn scenes where I have to kind of hold up my hand automatically because I just, I don't want that. There's a lot of stuff I don't like. I really genuinely, I forget about the, the nudity. I really do. Like, I just... I'll, I'll watch the series. And I'll try to understand it from a plot-driven perspective because I'm writing stories. I want to write awesome stories. I want to see good, Christian, well-written stories, not boring. And gee, this is God being the main storyline. A lot of people don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. And I'm trying to appreciate a good story writer. Uh, my homiletics prof, Dwight Perry at Moody, said, a good preacher has to have one foot in the Bible and one foot in the newspaper. So... Again, I don't just watch this stuff without Bible going into my head. I've got Bible going into my head, but I really want to understand how to write a good story. And I appreciate what Martin's done with that. And I appreciate what the actors have done. They're really, I mean, these are good actors and it's good producing. There is um, one little thing that I don't like about uh, season seven. I see a little bit of Dramatica not, you know, low quality stuff. Like you can tell that George Martin is not on the scene anymore because he's busy writing the books because now the TV series is supposedly ahead of the books officially or something like that. When Tyrion is standing up on the cliffs and Daenerys is getting ready to fly her dragon north to go rescue Jon and his uh, company, Tyrion urges her not to go. That looks to me like a Dramatica theory... We have to have someone who tells the character to reconsider his options at this point in the story. That's what that looks like, like Dramatica, Dramatica writing theory. If you don't know what that is, you need to Google it because that's part of writing a good critique of a story is recognizing Dramatica theory in it. Um, and, you know, lack of knowing what Dramatica theory is is one of the reasons why Christians don't write good stories. Dramatica theory happens all through these movies, which is why it's easy to anticipate what happens. I think... You know, I, I disagree with Dramatica theory that you need to have someone, anyone, telling a character to reconsider his actions at every single stage of a, of a plot turn. 
I think that who tells what character to reconsider his actions should be a core central part of character development. And I know that a lot of you are clapping your hands saying, Amen. Those of you that are good writers know what I'm talking about. So I think that Tyrion on top of the cliff saying, do nothing. Sometimes nothing is the hardest thing to do. Well, it was his idea to go north. It doesn't fit with the character. I don't think that that was Martin's idea, or at least it should have been a conversation Tyrion had earlier, and he should have said, I was wrong to send them north. Cut your losses. He should have included more in that consistent with his character. I think that Martin either will in the books, I'm not reading the books, but I expect him to do something like that if Tyrion needs to, for the sake of the plot, tell Daenerys to not go rather than just to compel the, the, the movie forward like in, a, in the TV series. But even if Tyrion needs to tell Daenerys, don't go, do nothing. Nothing can be sometimes the most difficult thing to do when you need to do it. If he needed to tell her that, he should have at least said that he was wrong. But I think that the whole conversation was was unnecessary and it was only there for dramatica purposes because the directors, awesome as they are, good stuff, they're following too much dramatica theory, just trying to give a fair critique, not be negative. Um, you know, they're following too much dramatic a theory in the absence of George R. R. Martin. I think it would have been much more awesome if just suddenly Daenerys showed up with her dragons and no one knew why she was there. That's how it's always happened before. There's also the unfinished, unresolved theory that the sky is blue because everyone lives inside of a blue-eyed giant and that Bran is essentially dreaming the whole thing and that in his whole Three-Eyed Raven thing, he's actually just fast-forwarding and rewinding, and that's where everything goes. That would be kind of fun to see. Um, I don't know if the audience would accept it, but uh, there is sort of a... I mean, that Blue-Eyed Giant thing, we are sort of waiting to have that resolved. One of the concerns that I have is this Lord of Light. I don't think he's all that he's cracked up to be or cracks himself up to be. Sir Davos said it very well, your lord commands you to kill children, your lord is evil. That's what he said to Melisandre after she brought John back from the dead with his power and human sacrifices and whatever it all that's about. Your lord commands you to burn children, your lord is evil. And that's what Israel was up against with the land of Canaan and why Joshua led them in to slaughter the Canaanites because the Canaanites just had a culture of burning children and, and burning people alive. And uh, what was it, King... Uh, Ahaz was doing the same thing when Isaiah saw God seated on the throne. He had a terrible king, and then God is the righteous king. And so that's even what the early church with the Holy Roman Empire was up against in its early days, human sacrifices. And I'm glad that Martin does not celebrate that and use that for good in the end. So it seems to me that the Lord of Light is evil, but he's trying to exploit something and quote-unquote, good may develop in the end, but after John finds out what this is all about, he banishes Melisandre, and I think that's a foreshadowing of what all people will do, the lords, the king, in the end, and the people find out that even after the Lord of Light helped them, that they don't want his evil and they banish him, and the help he will probably do is to use fire, maybe Melisandre, to burn the army of, of whites, the, the animated corpses, but then finding out who he really is, I really suspect a connection to the children. Um, who better to defeat him than Sir Randall Clegane, the Hound? I mean, he was burned with fire as a kid. He has something against fire. He's afraid of fire. He marches with the Brotherhood who serve the Lord of Light, but he's antagonistic toward them. He is getting a conscience from many different people, from the old gods of the Seven, which the Seven is kind of like a seven-part trinity, but a trinity is three, like the Christian God is one God, but there's the trinity. Well, this is a heptinity, um, and it is a monotheistic thing, although there's a lot of weird other practices also going on, but whatever it is, Randall Clegane is all about conscience, and I can see him coming around in the end to basically saving the day and taking his act of bravery and axing the Lord of Light once and for all, which ends a lot of the evil and corruption that's going on, you know. The children may have a role and a connection to the Lord of Light. I sort of see the children as the archetypal initial fallen angels that came down in the Book of Enoch, tried to make the movie Noah with Russell Crowe make it look like they were good guys when, no, they're not, they're bad guys. But um, it, it'll be interesting to see how um, the Lord of Light thing gets resolved. Uh, 
you know, maybe it's not going to, maybe it's going to be Benjen Stark who ends up going north as the new Night King, or maybe Jon Snow has to sacrifice himself for something else. That'll be interesting, but I'm still betting on if, uh, I'm still betting on Jon and Daenerys look like they're not going to get together, and they don't, and it's Ser Jor who actually ends up making the sacrifice. I was originally a fan of the R plus L equals J theory, and I originally believed that Jon would not stay dead, quote unquote, uh, back before those answers were found out. Um, I mean, Melisandre was there, and uh, there were too many other clues uh, laced throughout the conversations that that Ned Stark had, and Ned Stark was true to his honest character, what was really going on. Um, he was a man of honor. And so, you know, George R. R. Martin has these consistent virtues inside of people. And so... Um, all of those different things have to be resolved at some point. So I am kind of curious to see if there is a blue-eyed giant and what that was all about. And I'm curious to see who the Lord of Light is. I do think he is evil. I think he may have some sort of a connection to the children. And um, at some point, Bran has to warg into... Like, I, I, I wonder if Bran is going to warg into a dragon. That, that would also be curious to see how that resolves. But... I don't want to say that I predicted the whole series because I didn't. My big prediction is what's going to happen with the temporary falling out with Tyrion and that he turns out to be Targaryen who rides a dragon and that small dragons are somehow connected to him. My goal here is to try to point out um, different uh, things that, that George R. R. Martin has tried to offer that he wants us to consider. I really believe that the greatest problem, the greatest sin among Christians concerning Game of Thrones is that Christians have not written something better. There are uh, many books. I mean, Tolkien and Lewis did really awesome with some things, but we have not seen good quality Christian writing, not much and certainly not for a while. Uh, Peter Jackson was there and did a lot of good things, and we've got Disney rehashing the Narnia thing. But where are the good Christian writers? So my hat's off to the crew and the, and the producers, except some Dramatica stuff, but, you know, overall, pretty good job still, guys. I mean, it's a good series. I don't like the innuendo. I don't like the idea that Jon Snow is advocating this one world. I mean, he, I mean he's the Antichrist, you know, advocating one world domination in order to save our own survival. Um, that's, I don't like that, but you don't hear those types of critiques. You don't hear the dramatic crit critiques coming from the Christians that are against it because they haven't really looked into what's wrong with it. I mean, the, the problem, the bigger problem, the bigger war is that there aren't alternatives. If you're not writing alternatives, if you're not working with other people to try to make good literature, then don't sit there and throw apples at Game of Thrones. You can say that it's wrong. You should say that the church shouldn't tolerate it. You should say that Christians should do better. That's great. But don't attack Christians for watching it. If you're a Christian who watches Game of Thrones, you need to be reading your Bible a lot um, because you don't want this stuff to be the main thing going into your head. When the Antichrist shows up and when you've got um, global fascist, you know, Mark of the Beast, human sacrifice stuff going on all throughout the world, having watched... Holly, any Hollywood movies is not going to help you in that day. You need to read the stories from the man who died for your soul, who actually can bring you back from the dead, not just animate a lifeless corpse like the Antichrist is probably going to do at some point, and who actually knew what the future would be. You need to be studying the Bible if you really want something useful going into your head. But if you're going to critique uh, Game of Thrones and not like it and be against it and be upset about that kind of stuff... Write good stories yourself or get in the game. A few years ago, I wrote the book Game On. It was, it was kind of light. It was one of my earlier books. And my idea there was to try to convince Christians to work with each other. Because one of the best kept secrets about Christians that try to make stuff work is, you know, in like media and, and video and stories, is that actually it's a team. Like, one guy has the plot for Batman, but it's someone else actually drawing the comic book pictures. But when a Christian does something like that, he wants to be the same guy writing the soundtrack, the same guy drawing the pictures, and the same guy drawing the story. Hello? It doesn't work that way. One guy has the idea. Then you've got an editor to help make it work. And you've got the illustrator over here. You've got the game developer over there. They're all different people. But Christians won't work together because they all want to be the smartest guy in the room. They all want to be the one-man show. And 
That's what's missing, and that's why we don't have good plays, and that's why we don't have good thick stories. And one of the reasons that people talk about Game of Thrones so much and so fascinated with is because just for the fact that it's actually well thought through, and it's, it's good writing. And so, I mean, if you're saddened by sin, you know, learn from the pilgrims. Get good at stuff. Be a good writer. Learn to cooperate with people so that you can build a masterpiece. I mean, you can't just have one person build a cathedral. You may have an architect, but he still has a team of people that he's working with. We, we, we the Christians, need to stop cannibalizing each other, and we need to work together to fight the greater war. I mean, arguably, one of the biggest problems Christians should have with Game of Thrones is that Martin killed off Ned Stark in the first season. Ned Stark was one of those, you know, one-dimensional thinkers, those one of those altruistic guys. He was innocent as a dove, but he hated the idea of being as vicious as a serpent. And he didn't, He, you know, this is something Jesus talked about. You need to be as innocent as a dove, but as, as cunning and conniving as a serpent. You need to be smart. And, and he wasn't smart like that, as Baelish said, quick on the sword, but slow on the mind. And that's what most Christians are. And that's what these critiques and criticisms are. So I, I agree. And I love Bible teachers saying, yes, this is not good. This is immorality. That's not good. But the Christian role in this is to not bash Christians for watching it. It's to remind Christians to read their Bible and to encourage the church and Christians to actually do a good job with stuff. The reason I watched Game of Thrones was because I wanted to appreciate and understand George R. R. Martin's work. And I hope that that I contribute to my own good work. I'm working on memoirs of Ophanine. It, it, it should be done by the time you see this video. It, it, it may be available at Smashwords. Amazon.com always wants to miss the first 1,000 books that come out, so that's fine. But you can get the Moby file from Smashwords. I'm working on memoirs of Ophanine, and, 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 and I hope that other... Christians and people can work on other books, and I've got my own books, and I hope that one day I'm able to produce good enough material myself that would make George R. R. Martin proud and that he might want to talk to me, and that the actors and the directors who did the Game of Thrones series might want to do something that I contributed to. And that's what my goal is, because they really did a good job, and I hope that we all can get inspiration from their good quality work, from their good writing, and from the Bible that has even better ideas to try to imp continue to improve and make better and better stories each year. And I think that that's a better approach that we should take when we're looking at what Game of Thrones and Christianity have to do with each other.